And if you go to your if you go to your lessons and pop away. Actually, I'll do the share screen so you can follow along. And so here I'm clicked on week two under lessons. Can you see that, Amy and Gustav? Yeah. Okay. And then if you click on this, what I would, I don't know if you guys have YouTube accounts or not, but if you click on this, you can go and watch it on YouTube or you can watch embedded, but if you go to YouTube- If you open a Protestant Christian- And this little button here, you can subscribe. And if you subscribe to the Bible Project, that they have hundreds of videos. So not only do they have this nice little 12 minute summary of the Old Testament video, but then they have videos on each of the books of the Old Testament. Some of the bigger books, they break into multiple videos, like Genesis has two videos. But I personally, I did not make this an assignment because I did not want to make reading the Bible oppressive to you. I want it to be a joy to you. <laughs> but my, I would love if you read the whole Bible, but it can be very difficult in certain parts. And that's part of why I want to explain to you different Bible translations, why we have different versions. I'm pretty old school, but I'm kind of old. And so I'm very comfortable with like King James English, and that's what I grew up with. That's what I learned memory verses in. But I know for a lot of young people, it's just very off-putting. And if you want something more contemporary, something you can understand better. But anyways, we'll get to that. But I would love if you read the whole Bible, but I'm not making that a requirement. Um, but in the meantime, these little videos on the books of the Bible they're mostly like between five and 10 minutes each, but I mean, you're still talking a lot of time if we're talking like 39 books, right? <laughs> so I do not expect you to watch every one, but they are there and available. So let's watch this first one. And then I'll make some interjections on the way. And look at the table of contents. You'll notice the first three quarters is a collection called the Old Testament. If you look at the list of books, you'll see it's made up of 39 smaller works that are grouped into four main sections. The first five are called the Pentateuch, followed by the historical books, then the poetic books, and finally the books of the prophets. Now that seems simple enough, but actually it's more complicated and way more interesting. This arrangement of the books in a single volume called the Old Testament is a later Christian tradition that developed after Jesus and the apostles. In ancient Jewish tradition, these works were all on separate scrolls and were conceived of as a unified three-part collection called Tanakh. It's a Hebrew acronym for Torah, which means instruction, Nevi'im, which means prophet, and Ketuvim, which means writing. The Tanakh. Okay, first of all, the first thing I want to add is um, the way we have the Bible today. <laughs> well, this is how I have my Bible today. <laughs> Like I told you, it's hard for me to actually have a paper Bible now because I'm like trying to get it to open up so I can do the cross references and the, the internet and all that with the verses. It's just, you are living in amazing times. Like I have like a complete like theologian's library in my pocket on this one phone. It's just ridiculous. Like thousands of books contained that help me. But you see these old style scrolls. These were made out of like, sheep or goat or cow skin. In fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they've been able to do DNA analysis on, on the vellum, the, the flesh that has been turned into what they're writing on. And they can test the DNA and see that a lot of these sheep came from the same flock. They were like genetically related of the people who used them for writing. And they've been preserved over 2000 years on these scrolls. Anyways. In ancient Hebrew, they do not use vowels. So it's all written in consonants and there aren't any spaces. So it's just this continuous letter after letter after letter. And it's the context that lets you know what the word is. So to me, that's the first interesting thing. There's no chapters, there's no verses. It's just like, here is the book of Genesis. And it just starts solid consonants until they're done. Later scribes came in and made paragraphs, 
chapters, verses, and all that. But those are just things to help it e be easier to navigate. Because in the Hebrew, there aren't the vowels. There's vowel points to tell you which vowels, but that was even a later development. So I just wanted you to be aware of, that's so trippy to me to think about it. And can you imagine how hard it would be to find something? It's not like we can just type in a reference and the verse appears to us. You would have to kind of know how deep into that scroll it was as, as you're like unscrolling it, trying to find that passage that you wanted to read or quote somebody else. It's not like you could just open the book. And then when they're done reading, they actually roll them back up and put them away and they're in a place of honor. If you ever visit like a Jewish synagogue, they will actually parade their scrolls through the congregation and people will come up and they'll take their prayer shawls and they'll kiss the, the scrolls and stuff to out of respect and, and honor for the word of God. And remember, that's what the Jews were called, the people of the book. That was like their great gift from God. I just learned that last night watching. I didn't know Tanakh was an anachronism for the Torah, the, the Nevium, and, and the Ketum. In books as the Protestant Old Testament, but they're arranged differently. The Torah corresponds to the Pentateuch, but the prophet. Four historical narrative books, and then the 15 works named after specific prophets. After this comes the writings, a diverse collection of poetic and narrative texts. Now, this three-part design is really, really old. It's referred to in ancient Jewish texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Wisdom of Ben Sira, even Jesus of Nazareth mentioned it. And that's because this three-part shape is woven into the compositional design of the scrolls themselves. <coughs> if you pay attention, you'll discover that every scroll has been coordinated by means of cross-references that link each work into the larger three-part collection. So who put all these scrolls together? It was a long process. Some of the famous contributors are named, like <coughs> Moses or David, but most of the authors remain anonymous. In the Bible, they're simply called scribes or the prophets. These scrolls took shape throughout Israel's history as generations of prophetic scribes collected earlier stories and poems, integrated them into larger compositions, and then eventually shaped all this material into the unified library of scrolls, the Tanakh. It's clear from texts in the Psalms, the prophets, that these prophetic scribes believed that God's spirit was guiding this whole process so that through these human words, God speaks to his people. That's why they treasured these texts, studying and composing them into a unified collection. We don't know when precisely this process was finished, but it was somewhere in the last century before the time of Jesus. In its final shape, the Tanakh offers a prophetic interpretation of Israel's history that claims to reveal God's purposes to rescue the whole world. And while we can't do justice to the whole collection in one video, it's helpful to get an overview of what these scrolls are all about. The Torah begins with God creating and blessing a great piece of real estate, our very good world. And God entrusts it to a creature that reflects the divine image, human, or in Hebrew, Adam. God appoints humanity to rule the world as kings and queens of creation. And the question is whether they will trust God's wisdom to discern good and evil, or seize autonomy and define good and evil for themselves. But there's another creature with the humans, a mysterious snake. It's in rebellion against the creator, and it dupes the humans to foolishly rebel against God's generosity. As a result, humanity is separated from its divine source of life and exiled from a garden of blessing to die in a dangerous wilderness. From there, humanity keeps spreading and redefining good and evil, and things go downhill fast. They build cities plagued by violence and oppression, all leading to the foundation of a city called Babylon, where people exalt themselves to the place of God. And now the basic plot conflict of the whole Bible is set. God wants to bless his world and rule it through humans. But now, humans are the problem. They're under the influence of evil. They're stupid and short-sighted and headed for self-destruction. And this is all a setup for God's solution. We need a new kind of human. And so God promises that a new human will come who won't give in to the snake. In fact, he'll crush it and be crushed by it. From here, the story traces the promised lineage to a man and a woman, Abraham and Sarah. 
God entrusts them with the same divine blessing given to humanity on page one. And so they leave Babylon to a new garden-like land that God promises to give his family. What follows is the story of Abraham's family. Three generations, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, followed by 12 sons. And our hopes are high until we read their very dysfunctional and destructive family story. They lie, cheat, and nearly kill each other, not to mention the sex scandals. But what did you expect after the garden story? They're human. Eventually, Abraham's family ends up exiled down in Egypt. All these failures of Abraham's family form a dark background for the handful of bright moments in the story. God stays committed to these people. He even makes them an eternal promise called a covenant that he will rescue and bless all humanity through them. How exactly? Isn't clear. But Abraham's family is at its best when they stop their selfish scheming and trust God's promise with radical faith. From here, the family grows. They end up enslaved in Egypt, and we're introduced to the Torah's other main character, Moses. God raises him up to rescue the Israelites and bring them to a mountain where they're all invited into a covenant relationship with God. They're given 613 terms of the relationship, guidelines for becoming new kinds of humans you see who that? will faithfully represent God to the world. And Moses brokers oh. this whole deal because he's awesome. He's the ultimate prophet who speaks God's word to Israel. He's a priest who represents them before God. And he's even called a king, Israel's leader and deliverer in the time of need. But as the Torah progresses, the Israelites fail big time. They violate the covenant, and even Moses rebels against God. In fact, the Torah ends with Moses predicting that Israel's failure will continue as they go back into the promised land, and they're going to end up in exile once again. But he has hope that God will fulfill his promise to rescue Israel. One day he will cover for their failures. He'll heal their selfish hearts so they can truly love God and live. And then Moses dies. Now, the final sentences of the Torah scroll are surprising. They zoom forward in time. And we hear from the prophetic scribes who shape the Tanakh. They reflect back on the story of Moses from their vantage point, And they tell us that never again in Israel's history did a prophet like Moses arise. Man, I wish another prophet, priest, king like him would come along. And with that, we move into the Nevi'im. It has two sub-collections. First, the former prophets four narrative works about Israel's story in the Promised Land, told from the later perspective of the prophets. Things start great with Joshua's leadership. We're told he's successful because he's just like Moses, and he meditates on scripture day and night. But eventually, even Joshua fails, beginning Israel's long and violent descent into self-destruction, just like Moses and the Garden story anticipated. These stories mostly focus on the failure of Israel's kings, prophets, and priests how they lie, cheat, and kill each other, and worship idols. It's basically a longer, bloodier replay of the ancestors' failures. But there are some bright spots. God reaffirms his covenant promise to bless humanity through a new human. It will be a king from the line of David. And you get some stories about people like David or Solomon who have moments like Abraham when they trust God, but it never lasts. And wouldn't you know it, the family of Abraham ends up right where they begin conquered and exiled in Babylon. But remember, this whole story is being told from the later perspective of the prophet, and they know exile isn't the end. So they designed these stories of Israel's past as pointers to their future hope. When God does rescue his people out of Babylon, he'll send that new king who will be like Moses and David and Solomon were on their good days. In fact, this is what the second part of the Nevi'im, the latter prophet, is all about. There are three large and 12 short works connected to specific prophets. And this design intentionally recalls the three plus 12 ancestors from Genesis, whose stories of failure contain the seeds of future hope. These prophetic scrolls are loaded with cross references that link back into the narrative of the Torah and the prophets, and they carry the story further. The job of Israel's prophets was to be like Moses, to accuse the old Israel of failure and corruption, and to warn them about the looming result, the great day of the Lord, which ended with defeat and exile in Babylon. But the prophets also promised that God had a purpose, to purify his people and recreate a new Israel who would be faithful like Abraham was. They'll live in a new covenant relationship with God under the reign of that promised ruler, who's described as a new Moses, but called by the name David. 
he will be the one to restore God's blessing to the entire world. The conclusion of the Nevi'im is just like the Torah. There's a note from the Tanakh's prophetic scribes. They reflect back over the whole story so far, and they urge readers to anticipate the arrival of a new Moses-like prophet who they call Elijah. He will announce the arrival of Israel's God to purify and save his people. From here, we move into the Tanakh's third and final sub-collection, the Ketuvim a diverse collection of scrolls. Each one has been designed to link back into the key themes from the Torah and the prophets and develop them further through an elaborate tapestry of cross-references. For example, the Psalms scroll is introduced by two poems that are coordinated to the beginning of the Torah and the prophets. In the first Psalm, we meet the righteous one, who's described as a new Joshua, a successful leader who meditates on the scriptures, He's like the king promised by Moses, and he's like the eternal tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Psalm 2 then identifies this figure. It's the promised king, the son of God from the line of David, who's going to defeat evil among the nations and restore God's blessing to the world. And the rest of the psalm scroll teaches God's people how to pray as they wait for this future hope. Then there are the wisdom scrolls that address some of the most difficult questions raised by the story of the Torah and the prophets. So Proverbs sounds like Moses in the Torah. Trust in God, be faithful and obedient, and you'll have peace and success. But then Ecclesiastes and Job reflect back on Israel's complicated history and say, yeah, we tried that, and it's not that simple. So these three books carry on a profound conversation about what it means to live wisely in God's good and often confusing world. Two of the last books of the Tanakh to be written make a crucial contribution. The Daniel scroll looks back over the long history of Israel's failure and suffering as a strange door of hope into a new future for the world. One day, that new human promised in the Torah and prophets will arrive. He's going to be trampled by humanity's animal-like inclinations towards evil, but then God will vindicate him and raise him up to rule the world in divine power. And finally, the Scroll of Chronicles retells the entire story of the Tanakh from the beginning up to Israel's return from exile. The author focuses on God's promise to David of a future king who will reunite God's people in a new Jerusalem and bring divine blessing to the nations. The final lines of the Chronicles scroll have been coordinated with key texts from all over the Tanakh. They keep alive the hope of an ultimate return from exile pointing to the arrival of an Israelite whose God is with him, that he may go up and restore the new Jerusalem. And that's how the story ends. The Tanakh is a majestically and intentionally designed collection of ancient Hebrew scrolls. These diverse texts from all periods of Israel's history have been woven together as a unified story about God's covenant promise to Israel and to all humanity. They were made for a lifetime's worth of reading and reflection as these remarkable human words offer a divine word of wisdom and future hope that still speaks today. Wonderful. I, I cannot believe, I'm a super visual learner, so I just love seeing like the little whiteboard illustrations and you got the words, you got some pictures to kind of help you remember. But like I was saying, so if you go to this Bible project, you know, whether you want to subscribe well, to it's one of the most influential books of all time, but what, what is, is it does? exactly? Yeah, some people treat the Bible like a divine behavior manual that dropped out of heaven. Others use it like a... The New Testament. Stop that first. Okay, so if I'm on their website now, and, oh, they got it in different languages too. see Swedish up there, but who knows, maybe they, I wouldn't surprise me if they had it, so if that's helpful for, for you. Someone just was telling me they, um, anyways, it's, they have topics, but they also have, they have stories, they have topics, but for this class in particular, what I'm wanting you to look at is the books of the Bible. And so they got all the uh, 39 books of the Old Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament, but I'm not making you do that. It's simply, 
this is how you get to it if you're interested. Um, what I thought we would do, I am going to do the Genesis ones with you today, and we'll talk through them. But any questions before I go into reading some of the passages that I enjoy? Normally, see, if you're brought up in a, a Christian um, community or family, you're going to be getting these as like children's stories, right, growing up. And they'll be like bedtime stories for children. And then as you get older, they'll give you maybe like a middle school version of the stories with a little bit more detail. Then when you get to high school, they'll give you even more details. And until you read the Bible on your own, though, you won't know of all the juicy stories that they didn't tell you in Sunday school. And the Bible, it should be actually at least in C-17, if not an X-rated book. There is some horrific sex and violence and abuse, torture, all these sorts of things going on in the pages of the Bible. But it's obviously something you're probably not going to roll out Sunday morning with a bunch of middle schoolers. And, but I'm actually working on a book called The Stories They Didn't Tell You in Sunday School. I mean, it might just be for my own personal pleasure, but who knows, I may publish it someday. I wanna look at the Genesis one because so much, it sets the tone for the whole rest of the Bible. And then I'm gonna pick out like samplers. I wanna read you some passages that we can talk about. And I want to see how it's kind of affecting and impressing upon you. But that was a great overview. So we've got 39 books written over a period of a couple thousand years. Um, I forget, did it say how many authors were in the Old Testament? It, I missed it. We did, but uh, multiple authors over a long period of time. So this is the first book of the Bible. Um, Genesis, it literally means beginnings or like origins, the beginning of something. And they broke it up into two parts because like they said, the first part kind of deals with God creating the world and then man's fall. And then the second part, chapters 12 through 50, it's the call of Abraham and the uniqueness of the Jewish people, how they see their place in the history of the world and why they believe it was God gave this book to them and not to other people groups. So questions, comments before we do first part of Genesis. These aren't as long, so don't worry. First book in the Bible is a book you've probably heard of. It's called Genesis. Genesis comes from a Hebrew word. Uh, it's pronounced Ray Sheet. Uh, and it just means beginning. Now there's a lot of stories from the book of Genesis. It's easy just to pull out a specific story and and try to tell you what it might mean. But we think the best way to understand this book is to look at the book as a whole and show you how the whole thing is designed. The book is designed to fall into two main parts. You have uh, chapters one through 11, which is telling the story of God and the whole world. And then you have the second part, which is about God and Abraham's family, and that's chapters 12 through 50. And how the two of those parts relate, that's where you find the message of the book. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. The first part of Genesis begins with a creation story where God creates everything. And how exactly that happens, of course, that's where all the debates come. But he takes a dark, watery chaos and he turns it into a beautiful garden where humans can, can flourish. That sounds... Yeah, I actually want to read that account for you. Um, I think it's absolutely beautiful. I'm going to read it out of the King James Version. And part of what they were talking about is the debate is, we know modern science teaches that the world did not come about by special creation by a divine being, but rather there was like a big bang and out of like the swirling of the cosmos, the earth is formed, the sun is formed, and then the earth and basically life comes out of inorganic material and all of a sudden we have spontaneous generation life flourishes we have a single cell and from that we have all life we know today well genesis has a much different account it's talking about a specific creative act by a deity and its control of that act through the process other people try to 
wed those two views, and that's what we would call like theistic evolution, where people believe there is a God, but he used evolution as his mechanism to bring about the way things are today. And so I'm happy to discuss all those, but we're going to look at what the Genesis account says, but how you interpret that account, you can see could put you in very different places. This is one of the unique things about our school, in addition to our adherence to the Bible as the authoritative inerrant word of God, we believe in like a literal historical creation of the world. That Genesis isn't just a, a poem or a metaphor or a teaching, but it's actually a historical document of God telling us how he made the world. Now that can make you look kind of very foolish or outdated in the 21st century when they're teaching Darwinian evolution, right, or the Big Bang. So that, I just want you to be aware up front, that is one, one of the things that makes us unique, and you will be required to take at least one class dealing with that topic. We have scientific models of origins, and we have philosophy of origins, which I teach that one, or you can take world religions, which I also teach, and we deal with the different beliefs of how people think we got here and, and how. So let me read you the Genesis account. This is the opening in the Bible. And like I said, if you, if you get that blue letter Bible app, it is just so crazy helpful because literally you can open up the text. It will show you the Hebrew. Remember the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written primarily in Greek, Koine Greek. And it allows you to go in and to see like those of you that have ever translated or have learned another language, you know that certain words can have a range of meaning, right? And so the context usually tells you what that word means. Like we have the word bear. Well, bear in English, it can mean like the, the furry creature with big claws and teeth in the wood. It can mean to bear, to bring forth. It can mean to carry or support the weight. And so the context and even the sounds, right? That's all B-E-A-R or B-A-R-E. That kind of bear can mean you're carrying something or you're naked, you're not wearing any clothes. And so the context with the language. And so what I like about this Blue Letter Bible is you can click on any verse and it will show you the words being used and the range of meaning those words have. And I, I think it's super helpful. All right, so Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, and then I'm reading from the King James Version just because I like it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, and God, God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning or the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day 
and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. When I was just before class, I was having a talk with a student about, um, there's like a, a revivalist movement of flat earthers. And this is the passage that they use. See, it says in Genesis 1.16, God made two lights, the greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. And many of these flat earthers take the Bible incredibly literally. And I do too. But I also believe that there's metaphor and figures of speech. And, and that's what, and I always took this as a figure of speech like we have a light in the day and we have a light in the night. But the flat earthers believe this verse is saying the moon is generating its own light. It's not reflecting the light of the sun, but it is like producing its own light. And I want to show you a model if you've never seen this. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because there is like a flat earth sort of revivalist movement going on. I'm just so stunned in the 21st century. And I'm interested by it just because I love to hear the way they're reasoning. And I actually joined a Facebook group, a Flat Earth Society, and they're almost all like fundamentalist Christians that take the Bible like super seriously and literally. And I'm just thinking, holy cow. But they also are into conspiracy theories like um, NASA is just trying to deceive us and the government's trying to control us and they don't want us to know that we're living in a dome and it's all this interesting stuff. So if you, that account we just read in Genesis about the earth and the dome, the, the ancient view and even kind of the Hebrew view was this idea of the earth was kind of almost like a disc. Some people have like a square version, almost like the earth is like a plate inside of a frame. So that's how you get your four corners. But the earth itself is this round like disc within a frame. And then underneath that frame are like the pillars of the earth. And if you're coming from like Eastern culture and stuff, those pillars are on top of elephants which are on top of a turtle. And then you're like, well, what's the turtle on? It's like, it's turtles all the way down. It's <laughs> like this cosmic turtle going through space, you know, carrying the world on its back. And so these are really these ancient ideas. And so here we have this earth and then kind of like a cake um, dome you use to keep the flies off or to keep it moist. We have this firmament over the top of the earth and it is in this, and that's what's moving. The earth is stationary, we're standing still, and it's the dome that is going like this. And that's what makes it look like the stars and stuff are rotating, is because the dome is rotating, but we're standing still, which we can all feel we're standing still, right? Modern science is saying we are traveling at a thousand miles an hour right now. A thousand miles an hour. That's just the earth rotating. And then on top of that, we're traveling 6,000 miles a minute through space around a star. And that star is traveling through space at 167,000 miles per hour around some black hole at the center of our universe that supposedly eventually is going to suck us all in like a water going down a drain. And then our galaxy, the Milky Way, is traveling at over a million miles an hour th through God knows what, uh, God knows where, you know, through the cosmos. And so we have these two models. But what I realized as reading this is most of us, for all intents and purposes, live like we're living in a flat earth. We even use the words, right? Like sunrise, sunset. That's not what's happening, right? We, we don't say, oh, let's go to the beach so we can watch the earth turn. I would mess with my friends when I was in college. I was on the East Coast and we would see the sun come up and I would be like, oh, wow, we're looking at the backside of the sunset. And they'd like, what are you talking about? But see your sunrise, if you're on a globe, is somebody else's sunset and vice versa. That's kind of cool. 
But think about it. I, what I realized is for all intents and purposes, I actually live and think like it's a flat earth. Even though intellectually, I believe we live on a globe and we are traveling through space and all of that stuff. Practically speaking, I live day to day like I'm the stationary one and it's all that other stuff that's moving around me. Like I'm the center or we're the center. And, but I don't think Genesis is teaching a flat earth, but I can see how flat earthers, if you take those verses totally literally, you end up with a model like this. Any questions on that? Okay. I just cannot believe this is like a thing again, but I think it's kind of cool too. I'm just trying to learn how to listen to their arguments, to take them serious, not mock them, and then see if I can reason with them, giving them their presuppositions. But anyways, this is kind of like an ancient model. And even in some of the Hebrew texts, you can tell they, they might be thinking kind of in these sort of terms. Also, have any of you guys heard of Pangea? Do you know what Pangea is? Share it, please. I got excited. I got ahead of booby trap. So if we let me see our map. Oh, I'm sharing the screen, sorry. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Stop. Oh, I'm not sharing. Oh, my video's not on. I'm sorry. You guys that are in Cyberland, just tell me if you're looking at a blank screen because I'm trying to multitask all this stuff. So here's, they got us in the aviation room, which is kind of nice because we got all their, their old maps and stuff. And, but if you look at this map and you've probably seen people They've actually shown how the continents like fit together like a puzzle. And they've even done like samples, seeing you have like similar um, minerals and soils and things like that where these places would have naturally kind of fit. But after the flood, and that's what it says in Genesis, right? And God gathered the waters into one place and separated from the dry land. It wasn't dry land, but it was just like water and land. And then the belief is after the flood that the continents were broken up and spread apart. So that's what I just think that's super interesting. And that's something like a, a literal biblicist and a modern geologist could agree on this idea that there was one supercontinent, and then at some we may disagree on when it broke up. But this idea that it was one and then it broke into parts. Well, I got so excited about a greater light to rule the day and a lesser rule the night, I, I jumped off my passage. Did you guys also notice the way Genesis starts? It starts with this idea of the Spirit of God brooding across the face of the waters. And so I love to ask this question. If we're doing the, the days of creation, if we're doing the days of creation, we have day one, God separates the light from the darkness. And also an important thing to realize is the Bible does not start with an argument trying to prove there's a God. It starts with the declaration, in the beginning, God. It, there's no argument. There's no trying to convince you. It's just like, this is reality, and this is what happened. And so I think that's kind of interesting. But when you think about when it was written and the worldview at the time, you didn't have to argue with people that there was a God or gods. You might have to argue who had the true God or the right God, but there weren't a lot of atheists per se. And so it just starts right out the gate with God in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, some people believe it means in Genesis one, God created everything. 
And then in Genesis 2, it's starting a different narrative. Fascinating. But if you take origins with me, I'll get into that more. Other people believe it's almost like a chapter heading because it's like a Hebrew idiom. The heavens and the earth means everything in between. It's not just heaven and earth. It's all the totality of everything. It's like when in Psalms, David says, God knows my uprisings and my down sittings. It doesn't mean God only knows when he gets up or sits down. It's like everything in between. He, he is with us. He's 24-7 knows what's going on. So first day we have light and darkness. What's happening the second day? Good. Separates the waters. So the waters below, that would be like the oceans, lakes, rivers. The, the waters above would be like the atmosphere. But then it sounds like it's implying there's waters above that. And that's kind of interesting. So, yeah, you just go for it. If you just can't take it, I'm gonna leave you to help yourself. I mean, I can pray, but no, be comfortable. I'd much rather people be able to focus than have their eyes crossed or something. Anyways. Yeah, and I'm comfortable if you guys need to eat in here. Just, you know, just be polite and don't bother your neighbor. But I'm, we're college. It's, you don't have to ask me. But nothing. All right. So we have separating the waters, but this is how you get this idea of we have the oceans, we have like the atmosphere with the clouds. And some people thought God had like this ice dome or something around the earth. Like there was like this encasement of ice that kind of protected us from the radiation of the sun. Now, I don't know where they're getting all this from, but some people believe that this is what God used when he flooded the earth, when supposedly every mountain and stuff was flooded, that God brought down this ice shield. And it's part of why, if you, know, if you notice in Genesis, if you read the book of Genesis, before the flood, people supposedly lived Hundreds, hundreds of years. The oldest man lived over 900 years, according to the Bible. Can you imagine? Almost a millennium. Methuselah. Methuselah was a... Moses lived to 140. But that's still great, right? I mean, we don't have people living to 140 today. I mean, if someone makes it to their 100 and teens, everyone's just like, whoa. <laughs> That's incredible. And usually they're not doing so great at that. Moses, it said he still had his sight, his hearing, his strength at 140 years old. That's really cool. But before that, we have periods where people weren't even having kids until they were in their early mid hundreds or 200s. And I don't know if this is a thing or not, but if you look through the genealogies in Genesis, it will show you how old people were when they had their first kids and the younger they were when they had kids, it lessens the longevity of their life. And I think that would be a great study to see if that's true. <laughs> the earlier you have kids, the less you're gonna live. But it, it looks like that in the Bible. Um, but some of these guys, weren't having kids until they were like 300 years old or something. They're like, you know, uh, maybe we should settle down, start a family. <laughs> but you can see why some people are not comfortable interpreting the Bible literally. If it's talking about domes and pillars and corners and people living into 100 years old and the whole world being created in six days. And that's part of what makes the school unique is we do believe those things, not that there's literal pillars and we're under a cake dome and the earth's flat, but you can see how someone who would take a literal hermeneutic, if they didn't think about figures of speech or things like that, they could come up with these sorts of ideas. I just want you to be aware that that's all part of this umbrella of Christendom. To get back to my reading of Genesis, I only got to day three. So what happened day three? Actually, we got to day 
Yeah, it's day three. We didn't get to day four. Day three, we were talking about the water and dry land. And then day four, oh, and then we get, God said, let the earth bring forth earth bearing seed and the fruit and all that. So now we get plants. So day four, we get water, dry land, plants. I mean, day three, day four, we get sun, moon, stars. I'm assuming planets. And in this model, that's all up here in the canopy. And so the day is basically the sun is up here and it's shining like a flashlight. And the moon's over here and it's also shining kind of like a flashlight. And so as the cake dome turns, that's where you get morning and evening as these lights move around. It would be like if you were standing above like a platter and you were shining down a directional light onto it, is how the, these flat earthers are seeing the world. Instead of us being like on an orb, rotating towards another star that's moving this light. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's like, that's like a mini version of this. Yeah. I mean, how freaky, right? Would that be? But just think about it sometime. I mean, I don't know if you're into that stuff, but I love to go out at night and I try to like triangulate. I'll look at where the moon is and what the reflection, because I believe it's a reflection. I don't think the moon's making its own light. And you can tell by the crescent on the moon where the sun would have to be to be hitting it at that angle. And so then I visualize, and you can get apps too. Like it will actually tell you the sun is there. Or that constellation is there. And so I look at the moon, I look at the sun, and then I look at myself to like do these triangulations. And that's part of how I mentally imagine being on a globe, not on a platter or a plate. And, but it's trippy because we're not looking up at the stars, are we? I wish there was a globe in here. Like, so if we're up on the planet, if this is the North Pole here, North America is like here, we're actually looking out at the stars, not up at the stars or down at the stars. And those of you, I've never got to see this in Alaska, but as you know, probably four months of the year, the sun never sets. It, it goes around the horizon like a circle. Could you imagine seeing the sun just go like that throughout the day? Because the way the planet is pointed towards the sun, it's catching it the whole time. And then when the planet tilts in the winter, it will be dark for four months with no light. Like twilight, just going around, but never seeing the sun. Anyone know what happened day five? Fish? And birds. And this is interesting because some of the old church fathers from like the first century, when they're reading this passage, like St. Augustine, and it says, let the earth bring forth, he just imagines like fish just sprouting out of the water and mammal or birds just coming out of the sky and trees just coming out of the ground. Like all of that was contained within the earth. Even when we get to day six, we get mammals. or we'll call it land animals. And this is different than Darwinian evolution as well. In evolution, we have like um, a tree of life. Where if we start, Darwin's great idea was there's like this single cell organism. And from that, we get branches of all these different kinds of living things. And everything, everything on the planet is coming from this single cell organism. And so here we, we might have animals, plants, 
And then out of animals, right? We're going to have fish, birds, reptiles, mammals. And then out of the mammals, you know, it just keeps going on until we get to humans way up here. And in the Genesis account, we don't have this type of family tree with like kingdoms and phylums and genus all the way down to species. But what we have in the Bible is we have kinds. And the Bible talks about different kinds of living things. And so we, we have birds, fish, creeping things, Cattle and bees. Yeah, I'm going to throw humans up here. We get human problems. Very different from modern, like 18th, 19th century scientific classification. But see, in, in the Genesis account, instead of having a single cell organism that all things came from, you would have more like shrubbery. So here you would have, here we would have, let's just put them over here. Here's our, our beast bush. And out of the beast, we might get um, canines and felines. And primates. And then each of these kind of like a bush would then begin to grow and you know we have an alley cat all the way to a Siberian tiger, but they're all coming from the feline. Here we could have everything from a um, wild dingo to a wolf to a domestic dog, and all those coming off of kinds. And here with primates, you know, all the way from like chimps and bonobos up to like the great apes. But we would the Bible would have humans as their own branch, not like in this model where we get tacked on to this branch of primates, but no, this is our own whole new thing. And then we get different types of humans coming off the branches of like Noah's sons after the flood. That's how people get this idea of like three races, but weird, but we'll get more of that. Same thing with cattle. This would be domesticated animals like sheep, goats, Cattle. It doesn't just mean cows, but it means domesticated animals. So this is undomesticated animals, domesticated. This is like insects, reptiles, not real specific, fish, birds, humans. And so I just wanted to point that out. There, I think there's a bridge between evolution and creation. If you like pick up in the branches, there could be a lot of agreement in the branches, but there's a disagreement about the origins, or if it's a single branch, a single common ancestor, or multiple common ancestors. Questions, comments on that? You're just like, oh my gosh, but for you're in verse four of Genesis, how are you going to do this? Just, like, just, it's, it's packed. This is like some good stuff. Okay. And God said, let the waters spring forth abundantly. So just picture, it's like the life somehow is in the water and God's just saying, bring it up, bring it forth. And the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, oh, and here's your trick question. How many days did God take to create the world? It's six, because on the seventh day, he rested. Okay. We talk about the seven days of creation, but the seventh day, God was at rest. Not because he was tired, because he's an omnipotent God. He doesn't get weary or tired. But I think it was a precedent to show, I have done my work, I'm taking a rest. 
And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. This is day six after his kind. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Humans are created on day six. Um, and God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and every thing that creepeth after their kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So I want to talk about this a little bit. If God is spirit, first of all, how is a spirit speaking? Because that's like a physical material manifestation, right? A vibrational frequency that's being received and interpreted. But it says God actually spoke the cosmos or the world into existence, like let there be. And somehow out of his vibrational frequency of his voice, we see the universe manifested. But this is where I'm kind of geeking out because the more we learn about science and like quantum mechanics and physics, and we realize the world is not as solid as it appears, but things are made up of vibrational frequencies. Like everything is a vibrational frequency or a wave. And that's actually uh, how I'm not playing right now. That's how I personally see God as like what we're looking out at right now is we're seeing the residual vibrational frequencies of creation. And it is actually, we're seeing a manifestation of the voice of God. I think that's really, really cool. But it's a very different way of thinking about, because normally we're thinking about very physical, solid, tangible things. Let me read this. Um, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And then if you read Genesis chapter 2, it kind of gives you a different version of the creation account where God goes into real detail about how he made man, how he made woman, and kind of like the order of creation. But that is how the Bible starts. There is a God and humans, and he created everything that is, and humans are made in his image. So talk to me a couple minutes about what that means. If God is spirit, and if male and female are made in God's image, what does that mean to be made in the image of God? What are we talking about? I don't think we can be talking about the physical now. What does it mean to be made in God's image? Don't worry, you don't have to answer me now, but by the time you're seniors in my ethics class, you're gonna to have to tell me what is a human being and what does it mean to be made in God's image? So we will get to it. I wanna, if you guys don't mind, I would like to show you just these two Genesis ones. I might only have time for one, but and we'll call it a day. Which it does sound nice. In fact, seven different times God says of all that He's made that it's good. And this is where we meet the first human characters of the Bible, Adam and Eve. They're, they're both individual characters, but they're also representative. Adam is the Hebrew word for humanity, and Eve is the Hebrew word for life. And God creates them in his image. In other words, humanity reflects or is meant to reflect the the, the creativity, the goodness and character of the creator out into the world that he's made. And they're supposed to reproduce and make cultures and neighborhoods and art and gardens and everything else. But he gives them a, a moral choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And this is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. And he tells them, don't eat of the fruit of this tree or you will die. What's that all about? So up till now, God has been the one defining and providing what is good. And so God is the one with the knowledge of good and evil. But now this tree represents a choice. Will the humans trust God's definition of good and evil? Or are they going to seize the opportunity 
and define good and evil for themselves. No, they have you. Adam and Eve eat the fruit. This is the core biblical explanation for that concept of sin, that desire to call the shots myself. It's the inward turn of the human heart to do what's good for me and my tribe, even if it's at the expense of you and, and your tribe. And the problem is humans are horrible at defining good and evil without God. And so now that humanity's made this choice, things get really, really, really bad. So Genesis 3 through 11 is like tracing this downward spiral of all, all humanity. So Adam and Eve, they can't trust each other anymore and so there's a little story about how they were naked and felt fine about it beforehand but now they feel shameful because all of a sudden adam's definition of good and evil might be different than Eve's, and so they hide it from each other then there's another story of temptation cain is jealous of his brother abel and he gives in and kills him there's a story right after cain about a guy named lamech and all we know about lamech is that he accumulates wives like property, and he sings songs about how he's a more violent, vengeful person than Cain ever was, and he's proud of it. Things get so bad with the human race that we see God decide to just wipe us out. Yeah, we typically think of the flood story as about God being angry, but it actually begins with God's sadness and grief about the state of this world. And so out of his passion to preserve the goodness of this world, he washes it clean. But there's a glimmer of hope. He he chooses Noah and his whole family, and he saves them on this boat. Yeah, don't forget about the animals. Right, and the animals. So Noah and his family are going to reboot all of humanity. Okay, that's pretty fantastical. Claiming that all life on the earth was on a boat preserved from a worldwide flood. But if you're taking like a literal historical reading of the Bible, you can come up with that just like you could come up with a flat earth. Now, other Christians would say, no, it's more of a metaphor of God's preserving and all that. But many people at that school believe this is a literal, historical, really happened. In fact, in the early, I'm recording this, better be nice. In the early days of the school, some of the founders and some of their kids actually raise funds to go on expeditions to Mount Ararat to look because that's where the ark was supposedly rested and now supposedly it's covered in glaciers and all of that and I, th I think that's really interesting but I, I also kind of wonder like what do they think that will accomplish even if there was an ark on this mountaintop and stuff do they think that would prove the bible do they think that would make people come to God? Or would people simply have other explanations with how a ginormous boat got up on top of this mountain in the glacier? And I don't know. I like thinking about stuff like that. The interesting thing about the flood account, though, this is like a universal cultural phenomenon. You find flood accounts throughout the world, especially the Middle East, um, Babylonian, Sumerian, Egyptian, Hittite. All these cultures have different versions of a worldwide flood. Doesn't make it true, but it's interesting. And I think it's also interesting that even here in California, the White Mountains in California, they're over 14,000 feet tall. The oldest living things we know of in the world grow on those mountains. We have trees in California that are almost 5,000 years old, which is right at the time when the flood would have been about that time period. Uh, 3,000, 3,500 BCE. And these mountains are called the White Mountains because the, the soil on top is called dolomite. And dolomite is a metamorphic rock which comes from decomposed sea creatures that have been turned to stone. And so what was at the bottom of the ocean is now at the top of a mountain range. And the oldest living things we know of is growing out of that at just under 5,000 years old. I think that's pretty cool. Be a pretty great guy. But this is the story most people don't know because it's kind of weird. Just that Noah gets off the boat, he plants a vineyard, and he gets totally plastered. And then something sketchy happens in his tent with his son. It's a tragic story. So from here, humanity grows again. But things are as bad as before. And the last story is the famous story of the Tower of Babel. 
And in this story, you have all of the nations uniting together to use this new technology they have, the brick. And they want to make a name for themselves and build this big city with a huge tower that will reach up to the gods. But God knows that this city will be a nightmare. And so in his mercy, he scatters them. And all of these stories are underlining the same basic idea. When humans see autonomy from God, when they define good and evil for themselves, it results in a world of tragedy and death. And this leaves you wondering, is there any hope for humanity? Yes, yeah, there is. It's the very next story that answers that question. It's the beginning of God's mission to rescue and restore his world. Hey there, this is Tim. This is John. We believe the best way to understand the Bible is to get a grasp of it. Thanks, Tim and John. I'm really enjoying this. And it saved me a ton of work. Sin, in its most basic definition, would be that which is contrary to the will of God. So if God commands something, you need to do what he commands. If he says, be fruitful and multiply, you need to go out and be fruitful and multiply. If God says, don't eat of that tree, you better not eat of that tree. Righteousness, it's also kind of like a, a picture word. And so in the Old Testament, we see righteousness described as hitting the mark. And so this would be a righteous shot. Anywhere else would be an evil shot because you've missed the mark. Adhering to God's commands, going against God's commands, hitting the mark or missing the mark. And we made it all the way to the first 10 chapters or 11 chapters of the Bible. <laughs> we'll go quicker next time. But so much gets front loaded, right, on the person, the character of God and all of that. And I, I want to read you some passages next class in addition. But if you've never read like Genesis 1 through 11, please do. It's quite beautiful. Um, just the description of the world. And I'd be curious if you notice any differences between the creation account in Genesis 1 and the creation account in Genesis 2. Comments, questions? Thanks for joining us, you guys, and I will see you Thursday. And I hope some of you subscribe to the Bible Project. I mean, there's a lot of great free resources there, so but I'm not going to make you. All right. Thanks, Amy, and Gustav, and who was Finn? I didn't know who Finn was. <laughs>